what a distorted, confusing way to live. To be offered jobs and rides and free drinks, it's on how sweetie. To sense a room changing as you move through it, watched everywhere you go. To be someone people long to possess and to be used to this feeling. To be wanted so immediately, so often, that you have never known yourself what you might want. And he was mine, of all incredible things. What would I have told you about my husband in those young days of our marriage? Just that he had a lovely baritone, and he liked his whiskey neat. That he would lend a stranger $20 if he seemed like the right sort of fellow. And later, when we had a son, he carefully tracked his health and called the doctor whenever we were worried and tenderly soaked Sonny's legs in the bathtub as if everything were good. Always well-dressed and smelling of leather and wood, like a favorite coat or fine piece of furniture. He liked to smoke, but hated to be seen doing it, a holdover from his soldier days. And I would come upon him in our married home, leaning against the frame of the patio door with a lonely expression, right hand dangling emptily inside, left hand trailing smoke, exactly the position of California leaning against the Pacific. <laughs> he kissed me goodbye every morning at 8 and hello every morning, every evening at 6. He worked hard to provide for us all. He had nearly lost his life for his country. Loyal, decent, a soldier, American virtues. <laughs> all of that is true, of course, though it gets no closer to the real man. They are simply the things one would set upon a tombstone. And they have, in fact, been set upon the tombstone of Holly Crook. Um, Mary Gatesco is the author of Don't Cry, Because They Wanted To, which was nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award, and the novels Two Girls, Fat and Thin, and Veronica, which I loved, which was nominated for the National Book Award. Gates goes a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming here to honor Beatrice and Santa Maddalena. Um, I, I was, came to Santa Maddalena in 2007. I, I had actually never even been to Italy at that time. I had barely been to Europe, and I was a horrible traveler. On top of which, I had a horrible flight on Alitalia. Connection was canceled like five times or something. We were finally put on a bus, at which point I was actually dramatically sick. Um, my, my cell phone died. Um, I can't speak Italian. It was, <laughs> was helped by a heroic Italian man who was quite eager to help. And <laughs> was able to put me in touch with Beatrice, who said really one <coughs> single word to me, which was courage. Um, and helped me quite a bit to calm down and not be a maniac and survive the bus trip, get there in the dead of night. Finally arrived, it was after midnight, Beatrice had finally given up and gone to sleep. Her assistant, uh, the beautiful Nyla, picked me up and we drove up this long mountain. It was totally dark. I had no, I couldn't see anything. Um, finally pulled into this place, got out of this truck and it was, just an amazing sensation. I stepped out into this soft, fragrant, incredibly welcoming landscape with these, these subtle shapes of trees and the soft rolling mountains and thousands, literally thousands of fireflies all around me. It was like stepping out of this kind of tortured, convoluted, rattling thing into a place of complete acceptance and beauty until I walked into the tower where I was staying, and the, the, it was still a place of enormous beauty, but I felt like, how can I possibly be accepted by this place? It's so wonderful. It's so artistic. It's so refined. It's so complex and elegant and beautiful in a very different way. How can I possibly write anything here? I can't. It's impossible. And yet, in spite of my best efforts to defeat myself, <laughs> I did. I wrote. And I, I actually wrote um, a number of the stories from the, one of the books um, just mentioned, Don't Cry, and I'd like to read the title story um, of that for you, a little bit of the title story of that for you. To do that, I have to give you a little bit of setup because I'm starting in the, um, towards the end. It's narrated by a woman named Janice who's 
husband, a much older man, has just died of Alzheimer's, and she is in Ethiopia with her friend Katya, who is there to adopt a child illegally, but she doesn't quite grasp that yet. Um, all you need to know really is her friend's name is Katya, her husband's name is Thomas, and the child's name is Sunny. My time alone with Sunny was dreamlike and lullingly dull. The surreal darkness of grief blended with the bright reality of caring for a frail child. Sonny was not only frail, he was underdeveloped from his early life of illness and malnourishment. We had not seen the extent to which this was true, possibly because his spirit had stood out to us with such force. But our first day at the bed and breakfast in Addis Ababa, we saw him with another child close in age, and in comparison his movements were weak, uncoordinated, somehow partial. He couldn't walk more than a few steps, and his gaze was intense but not quite focused, as if he were suffering from a mild psychic fever. He didn't walk well, and at first he didn't want to walk at all. He just wanted to be carried around the house, out into the yard and back, again and again. The first day I carried him until I couldn't do it anymore. Then I lay on the floor and rolled back and forth with him as he clung to me weakly, but with a hint of triumph in his raised head. I rocked him and crooned to him and dreamed of Thomas, of rocking my husband and crooning of being rocked by him, of straddling him and kissing him, bending to touch my breasts against him, of straddling him and struggling to reposition him on the bed, Thomas cursing me with strange half words because he could no longer position himself. The little boy put his hand on my face and it came away wet. I kissed his tiny palm and held it. Thomas had lost motor control and could only get into bed by taking a sitting position over it and then letting himself flop backward. I had to let him do it that way. It was important for him to do what he could. But I had to reposition him because if I left him as he fell, he woke in pain. It made him furious to be straddled and positioned and it hurt me to feel that, yet I treasured it. I treasured his anger as a vestige of his pride, treasured that it could still make me angry, make me feel once more like a normal wife with a strong husband to fight with. I gave Sonny my finger, he squeezed it, and I rolled into a seated position, cradling him. I wondered if the baby wanted so much to be carried because his mother had carried him strapped to her body, or if it were something even more basic, that he was like a plant, and I a random patch of earth from which he wanted to draw all the nurture he could, lest he be uprooted again. I looked into his eyes and remembered Thomas's eyes, restless, strangely shaped. At the end, he still had the childish pleasure of sweet tastes, of touching the soft fur of Zuni, the cat. To see that pleasure was a kind of sadness I had never felt before. Sonny fluttered his lids, then half opened them, checking one more time, then slept, his soft little fist against my chest. Friends asked me when I suspected that something was wrong with Thomas. I didn't know how to answer. I think I knew before I knew. There were indications, most of them disguised as age and ex eccentricity. But at least once, the disease paraded itself garishly before me, and I didn't see it because I couldn't categorize it. Four years before he was diagnosed, we went to Spain for three weeks. We got back home in the evening, left our bags in the front hall, and went to bed. The next morning, I found him sitting in the kitchen, visibly afraid. He had no memory of our trip, yet he realized when he saw our bags in the hall, we'd been somewhere. I made breakfast. I described for him everything we had done on the trip. He said he remembered, and I made myself forget it. And because nothing quite like that happened again, I could.
After a few days, Sonny began to eat in earnest. Mashed bananas, cereal, formula, pasta, all of it. He made pyramids of empty film containers and prescription bottles and knocked them down. He unscrewed and screwed the top of the milk bottle over and over. He discovered that he did want to walk, and then, like a bomb had gone off in his brain, he discovered that he might walk up and down the stairs. I passed through a sad and enchanted mirror. I walked sunny like I had walked Thomas, his hands in mine, giving him a footstep pattern to follow, holding his eyes with encouragement. Everything depended on the movements of his blunt feet, of their exact position, trusting it, finding it again. Everything depended on it. I pulled my husband out of bed to a standing position and led him backwards, holding hands. I smiled at him, and he smiled back at me. I got him on the john, waited for him to finish, wiped him. I bathed him in the marble shower, which was so big it made the whole room a shower where we could be naked together. We sat on the fancy marble floor and played, passing the hose back and forth, spraying, laughing. And Sonny, with his little forehead blazing, several times nearly falling, climbed the stairs, leaning heavily into my hands. His hands radiated into my hands, imparting his being and sampling mine. Look, I said aloud. Look, my husband, my father, my lover, my child. Look at this little boy and bless him. Thank you. Quite a few uh, writers in the audience tonight who've been at Santa Madalena. Uh, maybe they would stand up when I mention their names. Stefan, Meryl Block. Who <laughs> has a wonderful novel coming out in June. Stacy Durasmo. Uzo, <laughs> We were actually judges and gave him the prize for Beast of No Nation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, John Burnham Schwartz, he's not here, no. And uh, Dahlia, so far. Miguel Sichuko. John Ray is not here, no. And um, so now I would like to uh, introduce Gary Steingart, whose first novel, The Russian Debutante's Handbook, won the Stephen Crane Award for First Fiction and the National Jewish Book Award for Fiction. That's a strange combination. <laughs> His second novel, Absurdistan, was named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review. Super Sad True Love Story, his latest novel, is a New York Times bestseller and best book of 2000.